Hi everyone, Jonathan Alexander here with the Los Angeles Review of Books, and this is Writing Sex. Today I'm joined by Andrea Lawler, uh, who is the author of a chapbook, Position Papers, and of a debut novel from 2017, Paul Takes the Form of a Mortal Girl. And I have to admit, when I first thought about this particular series for LARB, I definitely wanted Andrea Lawler to be one of my primary guests because if you haven't read Politics, the Forum of a Mortal Girl, it is an extraordinary novel about a shape-shifting character whose primary pronoun the narrator refers to as through the male pronouns, but whose ability is to shape-shift his body such that, well, I don't know, Andrea, would you mind explaining? <laughs> Um, I often, thank you, uh, what a beautiful uh, introduction, thank you. I often think that the writer is probably the least um, useful explainer of, of the book, but I will say that in the, the sort of premise of the book is that Paul Polidorus um, is like a queer college kid in uh, 1993 and um, can change his body at will and mm -hmm. does primarily um, for sexual pleasure and experimentation and, um, you know, social interactions. Um, and yeah, and I use the, the, it's a close third person narrative and the he, him pronoun, um, I hope by the end of the book uh, is somewhat destabilized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, you're, you're maybe thinking about his vagina or not. Um, and so I, you know, I, I think the, um, I hope that the pronoun isn't read as some sort of uh, stab at essentialism. Mm -hmm. no. uh, and I hope that there's as much sort of like possibility for instability as, as possible and, and hopefully more so by the end. Absolutely. In fact, I would delight in uh, recommending this book to, to friends and colleagues. And I would say, I give you a sense of what this book is about. You know, Paul is the kind of character, again, referred to primarily with the, the masculine pronouns. And the, the, the narration would be, and this is just going to be a paraphrase, but this beautiful narration in which the narrator would say that Paul snuggled the dildo harness up to his vagina and take it from there. <laughs> and that instability is so playful and so absolutely delightful that if, if anything, there is rampant de-essentializing of gender norms throughout throughout the book. Um, playful. Yes. Yeah, it's great. So the question that comes from that, um, is this a novel of trans experience? I mean, I think that's a, that's a great question and I'll just deflect it endlessly. Um, it's a novel that comes out of my experience, uh, you know, sort of negotiating um, gender over these last uh, <laughs> 49 years. Um, and, and I think of my own experience as trans-ish, trans, trans-ish. I, I, you know, I sort of, I, I feel, um, I never feel so particularly close to any of, of the identity words other really than queer, which is a word that works for me. And I think I came into early um, as a way to sort of get at deviance and gender nonconformity and um, just sort of oppositionality. And for me, that still works, although I know that's a fraught term for many. Um, but for me, th that works great. And yet, I think that negotiations around um, gender have been a sort of formative experience for me, both in you know, sexual relationships and in other kinds of, you know, ways of being in the world. And so I, I used to say that the book was thinly veiled autobiographical fiction, which was, you know, and then I would make some joke about how I'm not really a shapeshifter. But, you know, I, I think that most novels probably are, probably most first novels are thinly veiled um, or have some autobiographical elements. So in in that way, yes, yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, I hope that that the book would be of interest to trans and you know non-binary or gender non-conforming readers. I hope it will be of interest to readers who don't identify in those ways. And I've had some really um, lovely 
emails or lovely in the days when we used to meet people at readings i used to have some lovely interactions with people who you know identified as like cis straight men who sort of said oh you know paul's me or i you know that they want to tell me something about their sex life and i may be one of the few people who don't mind getting those emails um i'm sort of like oh cool bro me too you know like so it, it's been sort of interesting to see that um I think when when you write fairly, uh, I don't want to say graphically, that's such a loaded word, but like in a fairly detailed or descriptive way about sex and bodies, then the people who you do like then talk to about that, um, it's a wide range because, you know, we all have bodies and many of us are interested in sex. Absolutely. And, and I think I understand what you're saying. Uh, my version of it would be, I am not... Uh, uh, explicitly trans identified, but I also don't feel explicitly cis identified either. Very, very queer. And I really get in my own way a sense of, well, I, I'm a shapeshifter too. I've, I've been working with my body for the five decades I've been alive and trying to make it do different things. But even more importantly, I feel like a shapeshifter in my mind and in my mm -hmm. sexual imagination as well. Uh, and so the, the, the fantasy of the novel, you know, the ability to actually alter one's, one's body at will seems to me you know, not only delightful and challenging, but, but part of how we imagine, how many of us, maybe not all, but how many of us queer people and non-queer people imagine the fluidity of our sexuality and experience that fluidity. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the other thing I sort of, I felt pretty strongly when writing the book and then when sort of as it moved into the world, like I didn't, I never wanted the book to feel sort of like a trans anthem. Um, there's plenty of books that do that work and I have read many of them and love them. And I think that's wonderful. But for me, um, I don't want this book to be like the one book you read <laughs> on like transness or gender or whatever. Please God, read more books. Um, but there's so many books and, and it, and as long as it doesn't have to be representative and it can be playful, then great. Um, if you want something, you know, representative or sort of like the one book, A, I think there's not one book, but B, it's probably not this book. So no. that, and that's good with me. Like, I don't, yeah. you know. I, I, I get you. You know, queer, I think trans, much like queer, is not a monolithic term. You Absolutely know, not. A monolithic set of experiences. With that said, what I think is really engaging about the book is that it is set at a very particular time. You know, 1993, right? And so the We early, were there. Time I remember well. And yeah. I, I, I really responded to the book generationally in that regard, you know, somebody who is really coming uh, sexually of age at the height of the AIDS epidemic and, and then in its aftermath, but also at the height of ACT UP and of the emergence of queer theory. And, you know, Paul is somebody who studies queer theory. Uh, why set the book at that time? Well, I, again, I'll deflect. I, it wasn't necessarily a plan or an intention. When I first started writing the book, um, I, I thought, oh, I'll, I didn't start writing until I was 30. And I knew that I wanted to write fiction. That was the conversation I wanted to be in because that was mostly, you know, where I felt, I felt like novels were the things I wanted to respond to. Mm -hmm. um, even though I read a lot of poetry and, and theory as well, but I was, I was sort of like, fiction is my place. But I didn't know how to write fiction. I didn't know how to make up a, a plot. So I started rewriting Greek myths. And um, as I was doing that, I was sort of writing these sort of, again, like sort of hanging an autobiographical experience on the, the sort of skeletal structure of a myth that was already, you know, circulating. Um, and oftentimes it was an experience I'd had and didn't totally understand. And they were maybe experiences from five or 10 years previous. So I was, you know, I was 30 and I was, it was whenever that was uh, like 2001, I guess. And I was writing about, you know, 10 years previous. And as I kind of kept, then I put those stories away for a little while. And then eventually I started a grad program at Temple with Samuel Delaney and I, you know, showed up to workshop one week, unprepared as one does, and pulled out an old piece, and and Delaney responded to it, and he said, I think you're not done with Paul, and I, of course, said, I will do whatever you say, Chip, um, as I think is the only response to Samuel Delaney, because he's always right, um, but 
I then sort of followed Paul. But at that point, you know, by the time I, I finished the draft of the novel, it was about 15 years from the time it started. Yeah. And so, well, not a draft, but by the time I finished writing the novel, because I took many years of just not writing or, or sort of, so it, it sort of gradually became historical fiction. Mm. It had started out as sort of like recent past. Um, once I realized that that was happening, I turned that into a constraint and I said, okay, so like, what is it about that time that's helpful? And then I tried to constrain the period and keep to what would have been possible for someone of Paul's historical subjectivity to think or say or do at that time, whether it was language or sexual practices, you know, all of these things circulate in community. But it's a good reminder, uh, especially for my students, and I taught the book uh, this past winter term, and of course, contemporary queer writing. And I thought it was really important that we talk specifically about the setting uh, mm -hmm. of the novel in the early 90s, because this was a time in which many queer people were being actively invited by the larger culture to feel shame about their sexuality, right? Absolutely. And yet, there was a very rich queer subculture that you reference in the book that was all about pleasure and about totally. saying pleasure is going to be our response to the invitation to feel shame. Absolutely. I, I feel like that was act up in Queer Nation that I sort of came out into in New York and you know the late 80s. That was my community um, and and that's where I learned about you know coalitional politics but also about the idea that um, you know pleasure is our human right and that we you know we get to have a full human experience and we get to have pleasure and and you know harm reduction safer sex um yeah definitely yeah. definitely it's very interesting one of my one of my students ended up calling this deliciously theorized smut <laughs> <laughs> which i thought was kind of like I'm more please <laughs> So, and, and it is, it, it is a book that does not flinch in any way from being explicit about the varieties of sexual pleasure. Is it difficult to write about sex or to write sex scenes? I don't, I mean, I guess, you know, <laughs> well, I guess this will say something. I mean, I think the, the very first thing I wrote that was fiction that, you know, I wrote as somebody who was sort of like out of school probably like out of college yeah. um was <laughs> was like chandler joey slash um <laughs> and you know and it was a it was a time it's probably in my mid late 20s probably in my late 20s the the peak of friends yeah. frenzy um and i think you know my idea was um oh i'll i'll figure out how to write a story writing something i know has a beginning middle and an end and that for me is sort of like, well, you know, <laughs> all of those terms are arguable, but sex is something that can be very narrative or it can be very, you know, nonlinear, um, but you can, it maps easily into narrative for me. And so um, that first sex scene was certainly, um, you know, I don't, I don't even, I'm not exactly sure where it is now. It was, it was, you know, slash. It is what it is. Um, but I think the, the real difficulty with writing sex scenes, I don't find it difficult other than the sort of anxiety about writing something cheesy. And so I think of myself as a writer as sort of more like, a, um, like an inkjet writer rather than a laser printer. So I'll just go over something over and over and over endlessly and kind of tweak it and then finally be happy with the sentence like five years later. And, um, or not happy, but good enough. Um, and so for me, I think that, that it was important to bring to bear that kind of attention on all of my sentences, but maybe most especially sentences that had to do with bodies or sex. And, um, and there are some things that, you know, I might not write today or I let kind of stay in and I was sort of like, you know what, that's fine. I'm going to leave that. There have been a couple of sentences that people have said like, oh my God, I, I hate you for writing that sentence. Um, and I think like, well, I wasn't sure about that. And you're probably right. Um, Pistoning flesh blanket was the phrase that is most offensive to people um why did i write that but i think it was you know i think that it's like a it was probably like a like lyrics from a song that got in my head and then for some reason i couldn't get it out so i tried to you know 
curtail the cheese, but sometimes it gets in there. And that's the, the sort of, I think the worst thing about writing about sex is that most people think that writing about sex is always going to be really corny. Mm. So there's a sort of like a, a pressure there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the thing about sex, I think, is that in many ways, it's just a very interesting subject that's very revealing about character. Um, and so when you're writing fiction and your characters are wanting sex or not wanting sex or having sex, like all of those things tell us a lot about the characters and, and um, you know, their lives. And that's for me where the plot is coming from as well, yeah. to the extent that there's plot. So I, I think of sex writing as any other kind of character writing, mm. you know, um, or setting writing. It's telling us about the time. It's telling us about the people. Um, and, and there's just a lot of, you, you, you learn a lot about people by knowing what their sex is like. Absolutely. And, and there's something that you said, which is really lovely about you know, sex can be narrated. You made me think that what's interesting about sex is it's often dependent upon narrative in some ways, you know, the totally. story in our head. Oh yeah. That we're, that we're telling ourselves. Um, totally. Yeah. Uh, can you say something about what you're working on now? <laughs> or you don't have I mean, to. So. No, no, that's so totally fine. I'm, <laughs> I, no, I, I am, um, I'm mostly working on trying to figure out how to teach uh, my classes in the fall and homeschooling my um, seven-year-old. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not really doing a lot of writing, but in the back, the background processing is this ongoing project I have called Position Papers, which um, has been quite disrupted recently in a good way. But it's uh, it's been a project I've been working on for a number of years, a series of prose poems, imagining a near future speculative um, anarchist queer utopian seceded Western mass. And now things are shifting. So that world, which had always been sort of like part of a larger project, um, is something that I'm sort of chewing on in the background. I think I'm just doing a lot of observing right now. I, I think, you know, there are writers, and I value this tremendously, who write quickly and well about contemporary life. And I think I'm, I'm more of a um, chew on something for 15 years and then write about it type of writer. Who knows? But right now I'm still just observing. We eagerly await your, your, your next work. It is interesting though, how many of the utopian fantasies that some of us have been playing with now, now seem to have the pressure of blueprints. <laughs> it's like oh my we, God, I know. We, we need it. We need a new thing. Totally. Uh, so. uh, something you can recommend, something you've been reading or have read, uh, some, some, some good, deliciously theoretical smut. Uh, so, well, something you can read, something we can read. Well, um, you know, I'm a huge fan of Garth Greenwell's work and I, What Belongs to You and his latest book, Cleanness, yeah. um, which is a song cycle. I think he's doing some of the most interesting writing about sex right now. We are so different. He talks about himself as, as like just really attracted to melancholia. Um, and yet his sex writing is so, it's, it's extremely profound um, and beautiful. And I, I love his book. Um, I recently read this book by uh, Zaina Arafat called You Exist Too Much, which is really terrific. Um, getting at questions of addiction and compulsion and sex um, and uh, queerness. And uh, yeah, I think she's terrific. Um, let's see, a, a story I love, uh, one of the, the pieces of, of sort of like, like what it's like now kind of writing is um, this short story by the writer Bryn Kelly, who died a few years ago, um, whose work I, I just love so much. It's called Other Balms, Other Gileads. And I can give you a link to it or you could Google that. Yeah, um, sure. She is amazing. That's a beautiful book. I think, um, you know, there's a, there's a writer named Sam Cohen who's got a book coming out next year um, called Sarah Land. And she writes really interestingly about sex, as does Tori Peters, who's got a book called Detransition Baby coming out next year. And um, Megan Milks, one of my favorite writers ever, um, 
gets really into bodies and sex and asexuality and kink and everything. So, you know, there's a lot of people doing really exciting stuff right now. And that is, um, yeah, more, please. I love it. More, please. Yeah. Definitely. More, please. We've been talking with Andrea Lawler. Their debut novel is Politics, the Form of a Mortal Girl. Thank you so much, Andrea, for chatting with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's just a delight. Thanks.